Happy, uh, happy Sukkot. Yeah, thank God I got the right pronunciation of that to explain to me. <laughs> I think it means drag in Hebrew, um, from what I understand. And I have to say, given that incredible prelude, we are woefully underdressed for tonight. Really? We, we, we both went into panic backstage. It was too bad we'd have a little something something we could wear. <laughs> Maybe afterwards we'll reveal. Um, <laughs> so, Armstead, I was going <laughs> to... You're way, more, you're way more buff than me, so oh, no. I, I will refrain. No. <laughs> I, have to, I was going to ask you to read something right off the bat, but, but instead, before we do that, I do have to ask you, have you ever done drag, and do you have a drag name? Um, I don't have a drag name, but I did do drag in 1981 at Halloween here. Uh, my friend Charles Bush, who was not known at that point, but has gone on to be a legendary performer in New York, uh, realize, I was dating a guy at the, t at the time who used a wheelchair, a really good-looking, tall guy who used a wheelchair. And, um, and Charles said, well, there's only one thing you can do. So he got us up as Baby Jane and Blanche. <laughs> it was really frightening, because as, as soon as... It didn't take him long, either, with me. I mean, it was right there, waiting to come out. <laughs> and Will, my date, was, uh, was complaining about the Goodwill uh, Will store not being uh, wheelchair accessible. And I was just, oh, stop being such a diva, you know. And we, we got into that Baby Jane and Blanche thing. <laughs> Charles said he looked in the rearview mirror and saw us, and it was horrifying. <laughs> I take it this day did not end well. <laughs> no, it, it did. But, and there's a great picture, of course. And Charles uh, dressed as Lucy and, uh, and my friend Steve Beery dressed as Ethel. <laughs> and they, it's not exactly a logical foursome walking down Castro Street. <laughs> and we were getting all the attention, so they were making bitter Lucy and Ethel remarks behind us. So. <laughs> and, and, and Will had this unusual sensation of this thing that was usually just a pain in the ass for him becoming a prop. Mm. And so people were coming up and saying, but you are cripple, you know. <laughs> and he, he loved it, you know. So that was my... So, you're, so you're, actually your drag name is Baby Jane. I think we've established that. Is that um, okay? <laughs> I'll take it. Um, well, welcome and, and thank you so much for, um, not just for being here, but for writing the memoir that you have um, so beautifully titled Logical Family, which has a, a bit of a story behind it. Um, and I, I thought maybe just to kind of put us into a little bit of the spell of your writing that you actually maybe could uh, grace us with a reading from the, from the prologue to the book. Sure. Just because um, you're such a great storyteller and we sometimes in conversation uh, forget that you are a damn great writer, and so let's oh. maybe we can hear your prose. <laughs> Oops. Did you hear that? <laughs> <laughs> They'll fix it in post. Oh, yeah, fix it in post. <laughs> you hear my gurgling on Facebook Live. <laughs> When I was a boy in Raleigh, I was afraid of being locked in Oakwood Cemetery overnight. Every Sunday after church, when our blue-tailed white Pontiac cruised through the entrance, I fretted about the sign posted above us, gates locked at 6 p.m. I never voiced this fear to my parents, but it hovered over me like a threatening storm cloud all afternoon. What if we lost track of the time? That could easily happen as we plucked dandelions from my grandfather's grave or posed sullenly for daddy's never-ending slides, rigid as garden gnomes. Our family plot was on a rise with the other nice families, a respectable distance from the gate. So the caretaker, a runny-eyed old man who kept a spittoon in his granite cubbyhole, might overlook us when he left for home. That enormous gate would clang shut, and we would be trapped there all night, eating acorns for survival, <laughs> drinking dew off the lilies. <laughs> my brother, my sister, my parents, and me 
Cemetery Family Robinson. <laughs> this was not your usual ghoulish graveyard terror, since I found the cemetery anything but spooky. I loved its winding lanes and tilting stones, the way its pale green dells were flecked with pink in the spring. I reveled in its rich hieroglyphics, all those corroding angels and renegade jonquils, the palpable antiquity of the place. This was our family seat, after all, the ground to which I would return someday, permanently planted among my ancestors. So what was so scary about that? Folks in Raleigh might assume it had to do with the way my grandfather had died, but I wouldn't learn about that until later when I was well into my teens and the matter of why we came to the cemetery every Sunday would finally be explained. Even then, though, my focus would remain on the writing on the stones not on what actually lay in the boxes beneath them. Oakwood Cemetery was not just the landscape of our past, but also the very blueprint of our family for years to come. My father would eventually lay out the rules for his children in a self-published family history called Prologue, so named for a famous line in The Tempest, what is past is prologue. Antonio uses the phrase to explain his intention to commit murder my father used it to justify bragging about his ancestors, and he murdered the truth more than once in the process. <laughs> One thing is certain, the old man wrote after rattling off a roll call of all the lawyers, governors, planners, and generals in our family, is that wherever one of these men met success, there was a self-effacing and goodly lady by his side. Back then, I was still too young to realize that there would never be a lady by my side, goodly or otherwise. <laughs> Nor would I have noticed how the old man had summarily reduced his wife and daughter to dutiful handmaidens. I felt only this shapeless longing, an oddly grown-up grown ennui born of alienation and silence. Some children experience this feeling very early on, long before we learn its name, and finally let our headstrong hearts lead the way to true north. We grow up as another species entirely, lone gazelles lost amid the buffalo herd of our closest kin. Sooner or later, though, no matter where in the world we live, we must join the diaspora, venturing beyond our biological family to find our logical one, the one that actually makes sense for us. We have to, if we are to live without squandering our lives. So maybe I was beginning to understand something on those Sunday afternoons in the cemetery. Maybe I sensed I didn't belong there, now or forever, that my true genealogy lay somewhere beyond these gates with another tribe. So after um, this remarkable run of, I think, um, well, nine Tales novels and two non-Tales novels, mm -hmm. um, you turn to this very different form, which is memoir. And, and I'm wondering if you can tell me, tell us um, what prompted you at, was it at a moment in your life where you felt that you wanted to actually record what had happened to you? Um, oh, I think it's just about being old, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm 73, it's time. Mm. Um, and, uh, and I've always been fascinated by the form. And I realized that I could use what I knew already because I have anecdotalized my life for a long time. So I could just find the stories that I liked the most and some of course come out when you get into that territory you start remembering things. And then uh, use them uh, in a storytelling way. Uh, building suspense the way I would in a novel. Um, I already did there in the first, you don't know what the hell happened to my grandfather, do you? <laughs> you have to uh, buy the book. <laughs> um, I, I had dinner just about this time last year uh, at a gathering where the person seated to my immediate right was Patty Smith. Yeah, it, I was very excited and scared shitless. <laughs> She's a very imposing presence, uh, partially because, by her own acknowledgement, she's socially shy. So she doesn't, she finds it difficult to maintain conversations 
with people. And so at one point I asked her what, what I was curious about because I'd read her amazing memoir and I said, um, is there any advice you can give me for writing a memoir? I hate it, by the way, when people ask me questions <laughs> like that. <laughs> but she said, um, don't put anything on, down where you can't see the scene in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that was brilliant and mm. very comforting because that's what I've done with my work all, for years. I thought, are they going to stick around? Are they going to be interested in this moment? Is this going to be good? So, Well, that, and that's the curious thing because, as you say, there, and you even sort of do a little disclaimer in your, in your uh, foreword, um, you have mined much of your own experiences growing up, of particular experiences in mm. San Francisco and coming out and um, your relationships, uh, you've mined those for your fiction. And so I'm wondering what, what the difference is in a way. I, mean, I, would be, I would think that as a fiction writer, you would feel very tempted to embellish the stories as they actually happen for the purposes of a me memoir. So was there that tension or how did you to navigate? No, I embellished them when I was using them for fiction. <laughs> Actually, I don't know the answer to that. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I tell you either one, then you'll know what a huge fake I am all the way around. <laughs> <laughs> I've, you know, I've always been a storyteller, and, and, uh, and I, there was, well, there's a moment in the, in the memoir where I'm in um, the Oval Office with uh, Richard Nixon, and um, I told the story to Douglas Brinkley, the famous historian, when he was doing a, a book about uh, John Kerry, some years ago, and uh, he came back to me and said, uh, well, I, uh, everything pans out. I checked the tapes. I said, the tapes? <laughs> <laughs> I must be the only person ever to have dreaded the Nixon tapes because they proved that I was embellishing a story. <laughs> but he, I said, w was it the truth? And he said, uh, well, it, I'm, you, I give you a lot of credit for ha you know, being able to write funny stuff, but the real life thing was much funnier than you told me. <laughs> it had to do yeah, with... I was uh, going to ask you to just s set up why, it, why yeah. it was that you were shaking Richard Nixon's hand in the, I in the had, office. I had been... Uh, uh, I took a group of, of veterans back to Vietnam to visit, build houses for disabled Vietnamese veterans. It sounds wonderfully noble, doesn't it? But it was all a setup from the White House, specifically the Dirty Tricks Department, which wanted to, oh, I know, they're <laughs> dead. They're, well, one of them isn't, I guess. Um, um, <laughs> you're going you're gonna to have fun with this book. Uh, <laughs> you make that noise every time somebody <laughs> nasty comes up. Uh, I think you need to wait to about page 212 to stop hissing. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, and uh, it was a setup for Nixon to look like that he cared about veterans, that he cared about the, the war, what was happening over there. It was at a time, and the day we were invited there, John Kerry was out on the lawn with the Vietnam veterans against the war protesting. So even our invitation there was a stunt. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and Nixon was a nervous wreck with 10 young men, veterans. He didn't know how to talk to us. Uh, and, you, and I immediately felt, um, you know, I, I like to pull up the slack. That's why I kept talking to T Patty Smith even when she wasn't saying anything <laughs> <laughs> at dinner. That, I mean, you know, you kind of want to move things along. So I was uh, telling him stories about uh, what we had to do to set this thing up. And, uh, and in the middle of it, he, Nixon said, uh, well, you know, the Vietnamese women are not all that attractive. <laughs> but those little dresses, those little owl yais that make them look like little butterflies when they're flying down the street on their bicycles. And I stood there and thought, not only is the president of the United States trying to talk pussy with me, <laughs> He's telling this story to the only cocksucker in the room. <laughs> uh, 
we still on yeah. Facebook Live? <laughs> <laughs> Mark Zuckerberg has personally deleted oh, this okay. <laughs> recording. Um, but, but in fact, you're... In honor yeah. of Sukkot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so your fears that you have, were misremembering this conversation no, he's, were, it, yeah. were not borne out it's at all. It's right there yeah. on the damn tapes. It's um, right there on the... <laughs> Right there on the tapes. What I found really touching about the scene as you relate it in the book is that it would be so easy to be uh, sneering at Nixon in your prose. Um, you actually do come through as remembering yourself at that time, being uh, sort of, in a way, feeling sorry for him that he was so, that he was so nervous. And at the same time, you're, you're, in a way, you're castigating yourself in the book for having had the politics that you had. Yeah, I don't know who that guy was. Well, I do know who he was and know how he got there. And I know I was raised to be that person. I was trying to, nothing made my father happier than, than the fact that I'd been invited to the, the, to the White House. I was on my way to San Francisco to take my job at the Associated Press. Uh, and staying with this buddy that was also part of that group. You were on driving across the driving country. Driving across the country in my Opal GT. <laughs> Remember those things? They look a little miniature Corvettes and you have to lie down to drive it. Um, not, I totaled it on Russian Hill. I, I'm not a car person. Um, but I was eating dinner with my friend Tom in this very Norman Rockwell setting when the phone rang and and it was uh, either Ehrlichman or Haldeman. I don't know which, I don't remember which one. In the book you say it's Haldeman. Do I? Yeah. yeah. I'll stick with that then. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, and and, sh and she, his, Tom's mother came over and said, it's the White House. They want you there on Tuesday and they want to know where Armistead Maupin is. And so um, they tracked you down on your cross country they trip. They tracked me down, and my I uh, tracked Tom down, and I would have missed it entirely. I would have been out on the road somewhere, and I'm so glad I didn't because it was such a strange, surreal thing. And uh, yeah, so I, I got to call the AP bureau in San Francisco and say I can't report to work on Monday because the president wants to see me in the Oval <laughs> Office. <laughs> You can imagine how well that went over with a bunch of liberals in San Francisco. <laughs> well, I, 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 the, the story is fascinating, and I, I, but I want to press a little bit on this notion that you, you, looking back, you can't, you, I mean, you, you can recognize who that person was, but you, you wrote somewhere, I don't know if it was in the book or elsewhere, that you didn't really like the person that you were, and yet it's a very fond, it's not a self-flagellating memoir, and so I'm, how do you, reconcile the fact that you were at that point closeted and... Um, Pro-segregation? Pro, well, explain that one. <laughs> old, old man, my father. The argument was, it'll sound very familiar to any LGBT people in the room and everybody else for that matter, uh, a businessman should be able to make the rules he wants to make about his place of business. So it was the same argument that the right uses about wedding cakes today, and that's why I know better than anybody what, what the evil is behind that argument, basically. You know, you could get to the core of it, and there's, there's prejudice there. Uh, we, I did it. I, it was in, I, was in, I made a speech in student legislature about it. Um, were you uh, kind of... Just, <laughs> I love the way you... <laughs> <laughs> well, Your it, body language is so telling, I'm, Peter. I'm sorry. <laughs> It's all right. Just go right ahead and be disgusted. I, I am. I told you I was too. I mean, I not at the time. Right. I was proud of myself. And somebody told me the other day that I from Chapel Hill, that that I was in the the, the editor of the Daily Tar Heel, which was the newspaper there, said, you know, you, you were sort of our token conservative. <laughs> <laughs> and two years ago, I was given an honorary doctoral degree at at Chapel Hill uh, in letters. I was very proud of it and really happy that it gave it to me. And I stood up for this group of teachers and distinguished alumni and said, and uh, do you remember when I used to work for Jesse Helms? <laughs> at the TV station in Raleigh and the suck 
the air out of the room. <laughs> and it's kind of like they never get it right about me. <laughs> I mean, they were recognizing me for LGBT things. Right. You know. Not for your work for just Not Gnomes. for that. Yeah. <laughs> but I have, that's, maybe that's why I thought I should write the book. I wanted to explain my life's journey and why I think I'm a better radical today because I made that journey because I saw it from the inside. You know, Harvey Milk was, was a Goldwater Republican. Right, yeah. <laughs> and a naval officer like me, we all had some tight ass little thing going on. worked on Wall Street and... Worked on Wall <laughs> Street. <laughs> um, uh, and you know what did it for both of us, really? I'm afraid Theater. To, uh, uh. No, no, not <laughs> that too, but... Uh, <laughs> We'll stick uh, with theater. Yeah, we'll now. stick with theater. Uh, I fell in with a, a theater troupe that was doing a checkoff play in Atlanta because the guy who was the star had picked me up. And, and there was this party a, uh, after the opening night. And I looked around the room, and there was uh, this amazing variety of humanity, young and old, gay and straight. They all loved each other. Um, they joked about their romantic misadventures, whatever they were. It was the world as it should be. And I, it was very, very clear to me, that vision. Harvey toured with the cast of Hair, which probably took care of it quicker. <laughs> <laughs> he was a producer of Hair. And uh... so the, the thing that comes through so well in, in the book is this um, struggle to come to terms with the fact that your family and you uh, took great stock in keeping secrets. Secrets is a huge, huge theme in the book. Yeah. And it's a huge theme in your writing throughout. Um, people's secrets revealed, um, the toxicity of it, sometimes the necessity of them, but ultimately the necessity to, to reveal them. So, um, and you do reveal, um, as a good storyteller, you tease on the page two and then reveal somewhere in um, one of the uh, sort, of, sort of foundational secrets in your family, which yeah. you, you may want to share here, but I also want to just ask you more, just generally, um, if you recognize that as a, as a real sort of light motif in, in your Oh, absolutely. I mean, that, I mean how could, what could be more perfect than national coming out day. Mm -hmm. We don't need one day for national coming out. <laughs> it should be done all the time, mm -hmm. you know? It's not a, uh, it's lovely to, rec you know, to recognize the concept. That was at the bottom of everything Harvey said. Come out, come out wherever you are because that was the thing. We realized that it was what was poisoning us. The notion that we had to keep the secret at any cost and lower our voices. Um, in Raleigh, when I recently did my appearance, that was talk about surreal. Everyone in my high school class, it seemed, it was about 200 people in the bookstore. And uh, uh, among them, my brother and, and uh, his wife, who, and weird things are a little strained now in the Trump sense of life today. Very strained, in fact, sort of a divorce. Um, and. Uh, Jesse Helms' daughter came to the, to the site, waited for my autograph. Jesse Helms, who ended up being my, you know, uh, he was the person that tried to stop Tales of the City from going on on PBS. That was his, that was the burr up his butt that year. <laughs> And, and we should say he was kind of a mentor of yours early on. Yes, and invited yeah, I don't want to spoil it. I want yeah. them to, uh, right. yeah. But you had, he, had, he had looked with favor on your early life. Put it that he, way. Was, he, he told me I was the hope of the future. <laughs> and how right he was. <laughs> uh, yeah, and he, he gave me my first writing job, basically, there at the TV station. And here she, here's his daughter, and I said, um, really nice to see you, Jane. You've got a daughter yourself, right? Who lives with her wife just up the street here? <laughs> Matter of record, they got some kids. 
And she said, yes, she's gay. <laughs> it takes a long time for things to soak in in the South, you know. <laughs> Nicest person I should say. I thought, it was, I thought about it after. I thought, that's terribly brave really, that she came there that night. And, and what's the difference between us? We both had fathers that were monsters. Mine was a little more attractive and lovely. <laughs> <laughs> Funny. Um, I think a lot of his outspoken nature I got, to give my old dad some credit. Uh, but... He, um, he arrived, Jesse arrived at my father's funeral 10 years ago uh, before I did. And, she, and so Nick, Jane, the daughter, said, uh, I, we wanted to stick around. I kept asking Daddy if we could stay, but he was in his wheelchair by then, and he was tired, and he said, I want to get the hell out of here. And, <laughs> and so we missed each other. We just missed each other. Hmm. What would you have said had you seen him? Um, how's that lesbian granddaughter coming along? <laughs> If you rem remember, he said he called Roberta Actenberg that damn lesbian on the on the floor of the, of, of the Senate. Mm -hmm. He was right in there, just just time to call up spade a spade a pervert is a pervert. It just it, I I don't know. I won't tell it because it's in the book. And there's a good story about how I I got sent off to a Ku Klux Klan rally and. Uh, well, I'm spoiling it already. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the good tease. Uh, but uh, it's where I first saw his homophobia in all its blazing glory. Yeah. And I thought even then, where did, did this come from? Yeah. But it's something that you kind of recognized in your family as well. I mean, the, the, y you make really clear, and you, you, you speak of it as well in the, in the documentary that was made about you that, that came out um, this year. Um, really how easy it is to internalize that um, fear, the kinds of, the, the phrases that need to be whispered, the, the toxic shame. Yeah, um, yeah. It's very much of a Southern thing, too. Yeah, although I'm um, sure there are many in this room who would also say yeah. that maybe in, in subtler ways that yeah, um, it's, yeah. it's pervasive. So... Um, are you angling towards my grandfather? Do you want me no, to no, tell that no. part? Okay. Oh, well, only, only, if you, only if you want to. I did want to get, come back to this question, though, of, of, of secrets, because at some point there must have been either a, a conversation or a revelation of some kind where you realized it was safe to say either to somebody, I'm gay, or because you got a response that you didn't expect. At what point did that door crack open where you realized I'm not, you know, the, the wrath of God isn't going to come and smite me? San Francisco was the main thing. Famously, a friend of mine, when I got drunk on my ties and came over to her house, when I said, I'm, I'm, there's something I have to tell you, I'm homosexual. <laughs> and she came over and took my hand in hers and looked at me and said, big fucking deal. <laughs> Half the people in San Francisco are gay. <laughs> um, so that was the big one, but, and something that's not in the memoir that you just made me think of was I, there was a really nice guy that worked at the newspaper in Charleston where I was working before I came out here, and I liked him a lot and decided I would just tell him that I was gay. And he said he could totally relate to it because he had a wife who was 15 years older than he was, and he was ostracized terribly for it. We've all got something. Yeah. yeah. We've um, all got something. And, and, and by the same token, when you decided to open that, to sort of stop telling that secret, um, boy, did you do it big time. Um, I told every damn person. <laughs> <laughs> and you started to write immediately. Yeah. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious about that sort of, it's one thing to say to one's friends or one's parents. In this case, you actually couldn't come out to your parents that, that early on, but pretty much everyone in your life here in San Francisco, you were open. Um, uh, but what was it that, that allowed you to sort of go, 
whole hog toward that? And how did it change the way you thought of yourself? Um, I guess it was Anita Bryant. Mm. Uh, I was, yes, yes. There's a lot of leakage in this book. <laughs> uh, um, I, was, I was working at the Chronicle when the story came over the wire services that she'd started the Save Our Children campaign, and I was immediately thinking, what can I do to fight this? And then I realized in a flash that I had established a character in Tales of the City, Michael Tolliver, who was the son of Florida orange growers. This was utter, utter... Utterly coincidental. Um, Why did you make him the son of Florida orange Because growers? it was far enough away from North Carolina that I could... <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't quite be outing myself. I, I made him a little lower class than I was. Um, I think that really was the reasoning. It was close enough to North Carolina it was that, close that you felt enough. comfortable, but far enough that they couldn't say, oh, yeah. that's his alter ego. Huh. And then I realized I could have his mother join the Save Our Children Foundation and write him a letter about it, totally clueless about her gay son as she would be because he wasn't being any more open to his family than I was. Mm. And so uh, it was a godsend. Yeah, and, and that's what led to really, in some ways, the most famous few paragraphs of yours, the, the letter to Mama, um, in which Michael Tolliver comes out to his, to his parents in a letter from San Francisco that was Maybe nobody knew it at the time except you and your own family that this was your coming out to them. Yeah, it was, I knew that they would know. It was just too personal. Um, and I needed to say it because my mother was ill, basically not far from dying of cancer. And I wanted her to know because she's such a worrier her whole life. And I talk about that in the book, about all the things she was trying to get right about me so I wouldn't be hurt. Don't hang, I don't think you should spend so much time with your friend Eddie because he's kind of sissy and people might get the wrong idea. <laughs> I just like going to the movies with him. I had no idea that he was kind of sissy. Um, and uh, she took the every, on everything of her children. You know, she was always worried about them. And I wanted her to know the truth that what I was, what I had understood about myself, was the light and the joy of my life. I mean it then, I mean it now. And when she said to me, uh, we got to talk about it some more after I was out, she said, I'm just afraid it'll hurt your career. And I said, it is my career. <laughs> I knew that then, I knew it. Um, so the whole process was ab about trying to m make them see that. Which you think sh she, she did in her own way? Yes, yeah, she did. You know, she, um, it doesn't spoil too much to say that when she was, I saw her for the last time in her hospital room, um, she told me to come back early in the morning because she had an orderly she wanted me to meet. <laughs> She was getting everything in order. You know. <laughs> Making sure you were set. Um, it, it's, it's a very fond portrait um, of, of your mother. And, and despite your, um, your righteous anger, and maybe still there, uh, about your father, it actually also is, it's, um, there is affection there. And I oh, think, yeah. Uh, with, with your dad, even though he's, it's easy to p portray him in a way as, in, in a way, as, as one of the villains. Um, but uh, did you struggle with how to, in the writing of it, as to how to navigate that line between, you know, you have to essentially out him as a, as a bigot? As, yeah, you, you know, have to oh, use yeah. his language. And everybody who knew him knew that's the way he talked, you know. And much of the South talked that way. I mean, we, we, we gloss it over now, and we, we, we say the N-word, and we don't want to... Um, you know, we don't want to speak in that ugly language. We use the euphemism. We don't, yeah, exactly, yeah. right, yeah. We, the N-word euphemism. Right. Um, but um, it, it's kind of important to remember how ugly it was and where, and, and still is, by the way, mm -hmm. still is.
we just realized that um, I feel so ignorant in some ways to realize, to realize that the, the, the people, Trump supporters had spent eight years hating a black man, hating him, and Trump's task has now been to undo every single thing that this wise, kind, generous man brought to America. Mm. And we're watching him just tick them off. Um, so I'm sorry, it's <laughs> terrible, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> well, um, we've got <laughs> these are the times that, that we live in. Um, and, and I think you, the, the book in some ways is, a, is also, as so much of your writing has been a kind of um, a, 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 a peon, is that, that's the right word, a, a, a bouquet to the safe haven that San Francisco is, but yeah. even, you know, we're not, we're the, not safe. Yeah. I want to say sukkah. I don't want to. <laughs> the sukkah, it was my sukkah. It was my safe place. I saw it immediately. That's why I invented 28 Barbary Lane. I thought, I want to have a place where people feel safe and cozy and connected to the world. It's mm, a really lovely image. Um, I, I want to also ask you to talk a little bit about, since it's National Coming Out Day and. and um, there's, there's also been a theme in your public expression, your, your, your life, where you've really wanted people who are in positions of visibility to own it, to come out to say, I'm queer. Um, and that's sometimes gotten you into some hot water. You write yes, a little- Yes, it has, yeah. it still does. I mean, I mean, I don't do it a lot, it's exhausting. Um, uh, I've lost, people that were potentially friends because I just made it clear to them that I thought they needed to take care of that. And it's just how I feel about them. I don't have respect for people who do that. There's less of it now than there was before, but I don't, in the midst of the aid, AIDS, when that was ravaging the city, to see people being precious about that, hiding it. You talk a lot about your, your friendship, or uh, acquaintanceship um, flings with Rock Hudson and what? It was a friendship. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't really a fling. I mean, it was play. It was what boys do sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that said, when you were asked toward the end of his life, or maybe it was after he, he died or was gravely ill, um, by a magazine, um, to confirm, so to speak, that he was gay. I was asked by Randy Schiltz, who was working at the Chronicle. Randy, who interestingly, when the outing controversy started, said he was strictly opposed to it. But in fact, the outing happened in the Chronicle when Randy Schiltz called and asked me if I would talk about my friendship with Rock, and that, that gave him the headline. The press needed a way to talk about what everyone knew in a civilized way. And I knew that I was the person to do it. Because I stopped having any shame about my, being gay myself. I was his friend. And I knew that he needed rescuing from the tabloids because they were already doing, you know, the lethal kiss with, uh, what's her name, from Dynasty. Um, oh, uh, Linda Evans. Yeah, and the people around Rock were old school, Queens, that, uh, whose whole job had been to, to cover up for him. And they were now saying that he had, he'd been on a watermelon diet, that he had anorexia, anything. But they had no dignified way into the truth. I realized they didn't. Uh, and so I told Randy that I would talk to him, and I did. And, I, and the old guy that ran the flower shop down on Castro Street clucked his tongue at me as I walked past. And hmm. a columnist in the BAR said, what kind of a friend would do that? Well, a friend that doesn't think being gay is the worst thing in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah, so I won't go into any of the others. It's, it's all, it, eventually it all works out because they come out they marry their long-time love, and everybody gets to celebrate them, mm. and no one remembers that they spent many, many years avoiding that subject. Right, um, well, I think that's, that's what's 
in a way hard to remember at the, that at the time uh, there still wasn't a good way of talking about it and there still was a huge amount of shame um, that was, uh, and I think it took a tremendous amount of courage in a way for you to not only be so, um, to be so without shame, but also perhaps, did you know that you were risking friendships or that people would Oh, I, I was you? scared to death. I knew, I, knew what I, I knew what I was doing and I was scared to death. And I knew I was doing it for all my friends who had died and, and had been perfectly open about their own being gay and having AIDS and everything else. Here, here, you know, here's, he's got this terrible disease and still the big secret is the fact that he's gay, you know. I had gay men say to me, oh, it's too bad we couldn't have persuaded him, persuaded the world that he was straight because then people would have cared about AIDS. Mm. Well, that's wow. just a heartbreaking thing mm. to say, but it shows you where we were. Mm -hmm. um, and I was really worried. I, didn't, I, had lo I had lost contact with the castle as Rock's world was known as. And, uh, and I didn't know, I, I was worried about what the response had been and how, to what degree he, he had suffered. I knew that the 30,000 letters came to the hospital telling him they loved him exactly the way he was, which was a shock to him. He thought it would all be over. And, and I know that his biographer said to me when she arrived at my house, Rock said you were the first person I should talk to. So uh, he got it. And, uh, and now the world gets it, because all we ever think about is was how brave he was to be out. But he wasn't. He wasn't, yeah. Um, the world has changed, though, and it's a lot easier for younger people, um, even those in the public eye, to be, to be out and creative and role models. Um, but I, I, I'm wondering, um, what do you see as some of the, still some of the challenges to be knocked down, whether it's, I'm not talking about necessarily, or, or maybe I am talking about um, legal challenges, but I'm thinking more cultural acceptance. Are, have we, are we in the golden age now where everybody can be um, uh, without? We are, if you don't live in the Middle East or in Africa or in uh, Chechnya. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are atrocities happening all over the world um, to LGBT people, and I think you know, we have, to, we have to offer help outwards in that way. And to, I mean, I'm so happy that the, the, the Gay Men's Chorus has got their tour right now, the Lavender Pen tour going all over the South. It, uh, you know, that's, that offers strength to queer kids in those places. I don't know if it's ever gonna change the mind of the bigots that are making life hell for queer kids. Uh, or the churches that use it as a way to raise money because they can scare people with it. Right, or a government that still holds up barriers to or trans folks. Or a, gov folks. a government um, yeah. that... Uh, um, the, the, the one last area that I want to talk about before we um, take uh, audience questions is um, uh, there's something quite touching in the book where you, um, you had a friendship with Christopher Isherwood and still do have with his... Um, with his uh, uh, longtime uh, husband or partner from the, yeah. from the time, Don Bacardi, and you are now the age um, that Isherwood was when he uh, wrote diaries um, that sort of, uh, in a way, is established, hel helped us understand his role as a kind of uh, a gay elder. Or I don't forget the term that you used for him, almost um, jokingly. Well, I didn't use it. He couple. did. I, 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 he had these amazing diaries that he kept for years, and Don, his partner, has released them a bit at a time, and I've been nervous because the ones that I might be in <laughs> hadn't been published yet, you know. <laughs> so I, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm remembering a, a story about Gore Vidal, who had a, uh, published a memoir, and he, uh, on the, in the index, where he had the names of all the people who were in the book, uh, he had ri written a, a marginal notation in the book that he gave uh, to Norman Mailer, which just said, hi, Norm, <laughs> knowing that Mailer would go to the index and say, where am I? <laughs> um, so I, that's exactly what I did. I stood at a bookstore. And, went, <laughs> uh, and I know that now that um, 
when one of the most thrilling nights of my life was when I got to introduce Isherwood at Norse Auditorium when he was in town making a speech. And, uh, and Isherwood wrote, Armistead Maupin laid it on a little thick last night, <laughs> trying to make me sound like America's old Mr. Queer. <laughs> well, that's what he was to me, you know. And he said, I, th I don't think he's a false flatterer. I think we're going to be friends. And uh, we did become wonderful friends. And Don, to this day, still is my guide for you know, moving forward into life. He's 10 years older than I am. So uh, I love having someone like that in my life. And that's what Chris and Don did. They, the people who came to see them at the house were every age. Mm. And they would be porn actors and David Hockney and, <laughs> you know, you name it, they were there. So it, it, that's one of the things that, I mean, you are seen, um, for better or for worse, and maybe it's a mantle that you, that you don't like, um, in a way as now you're, you're one of the, um, and, and I say this with, with respect and admiration, but you are one of the elders, you're one of the voices, and I'm wondering if, that, if that's very uncomfortable. Um, it, sometimes. For you. Yeah. Sometimes. Um, but he, Isherwood, I mean, again, it, the wisdom of Isherwood is right there in the diaries. I know I have to get rid of my senile resentments. I thought, oh, I have those. <laughs> <laughs> the, young, the young need encouraging, and that's my job to encourage them. He says it in the diary. Mm. Uh, the other night at the Y in New York, at the Y, not at what? the Y, but at the, at the, the 92nd, 92nd Street, Street y, y speakers program, that would be a whole different thing, wouldn't it? <laughs> I, was, I was with Jonathan Groff at the Y. <laughs> Cue the village people. Yeah. The, um. the, the, <laughs> yeah, it's, except it's, you know, it's H-A. Right, know. of course, yes. Um, hey, we have fun too. All good know. speakers programs are run by Jews, <laughs> all of them, I can tell you right now. Um, so yes, back at the 92nd Street Y, on stage on with stage, Jonathan. On stage, Jonathan uh, did that with me in, in a nice, really nice way, and I felt myself squirming a little bit and trying not to. Um, and it's distracting when there's that much beauty right in your face, <laughs> um, saying such nice things. But I, and I told him later, um, in fact, maybe I told him on stage, that... Um, I want to. I want to be a big boy and give that right back. You know, Isherwood did it with me and with a lot of people. Yeah. He he was in the phone book. If you wanted to look up Christopher Isherwood, you could find him in the Santa Monica phone book. <laughs> you can still find Don in the Santa Monica phone book. And, and is do you, do you take that uh, responsibility seriously? It's kind of like transmitting. Um, queer culture or just your, yourself? Like, do you, do you seek out, um, or you're, you're willing to, to be a mentor? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I didn't mean that to be a solicitation. No, um. I, <laughs> <laughs> That sounds dangerously close to a Kickstarter program. <laughs> <laughs> no, of course, you know, and any time it arises in life, mostly it's with friends, you know. Um, we can be very useful to each other uh, intergenerationally as queers. It's wonderful to have somebody older or younger that you can talk to. Uh, one of the, one of the, one of the uh, biographies of Chris really upset Don because it said uh, his friends got younger and younger the, the, the older he got. <laughs> I thought, well, <laughs> is there a problem there? <laughs> I mean, I hear people talking about, oh, we, or we, we neglect our senior, you know, our elders. Um, but, um, and that's certainly true to a certain degree, but I think when people, when young people find out what there is that you can get out of older people and vice versa, only good things happen. Well, on that note, we, there are probably many young people, but also, um, uh, Co-generationists in the uh, in the house, and <laughs> and maybe some wise elders. He's trying elders. to say old people like me. <laughs> well, like me too. Like um, us. 
But uh, this may be a good point to see if we have some, yeah, some cool. questions and, and, yeah. uh, and thoughts for Armistead. So there are folks with mics, so make yourself um, known by raising your hand. We'll, somebody will come to you. We've got a question right over here on your left. Um, just getting to a comparison of writing fiction versus writing about your own life. I mean, we all hope that you get as much joy out of doing the writing as we do reading about it. Could you speak to um, comparing how, whether you get pleasure or stress out of writing with fictional characters versus writing with real people, and does it help if the real people are living or dead? Um, it helps if your parents are dead. <laughs> um, I think I wrote a book that my parents would love. My father actually liked an autobiographical book I wrote that talked about his father's suicide. Uh, he was glad to have it out there and not to have to talk about it, you know, just there in the book. Uh, I, I wish I had the encouraging news about my writing process. I mean, it's all hard for me. I write, I work very slowly. Uh, and that hasn't always been the case. I mean, with Tales, you had to knock out. I had to, yeah. I had to write 800 words a day. Um, and I got to go back and clean it up, when it, or dirty it up, as the case may be, <laughs> when it was no longer in the Chronicle. Um, oh. Um, so I guess you're asking, what's the difference? It, it wasn't that different for me because I was simply using my own life as subject matter. And I used some of the manipulative techniques that I use in fiction. Anybody who tells you that a memoir is exactly the way it happened is lying to you. <laughs> um, who could remember such things? Who could reconstruct complete conversations from 50 years ago? You can remember the gist of it. I had real guidance uh, when I was writing this uh, in a, from a book called The Art of Memoir by Mary Carr, who wrote mm -hmm. The Liars Club. Mm -hmm. She's kind of the queen of memoir now. And uh, she takes 10 memoirs that she loves, uh, and it's all over the place. It's uh, Nabokov and um, uh, Tim O'Brien. Uh, I'm not going to remember them, but she analyzes what she loves about each one, and what she stresses is, in each case, you're hearing their voice. You know who they are. So that's what I tried to do. I've always tried to do that. I've always wanted my voice to be heard, through my characters, at least. What, you have a lovely phrase in, what, I, woo, somewhere in here, um, in which you say um, that you've done your best not to uh, write the thoughts of anybody except yourself, which yeah. I think is a really interesting distinction. You can say what somebody said, or that you're to your best recollection. Yeah, I'm not trying to read anybody's mind, and some people in there, because I can't read their minds too well, and I don't want to write about it, if you know what I mean. Um, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not I don't want what? to be unkind. Okay. Uh, and there are stories that would put you in that position. I think that's a, that's a perilous place to be with memoir. Um, she, Mary Carr is really good about pointing out all the various things that can happen. Um, and I had her editor as my editor at HarperCollins, Jennifer Barth, who would say things to me like, I bet that works really well on the stage, but you might not want to put it on the page. <laughs> because I had been trying out my material in a room full of drunk bears in Provincetown. <laughs> and part of me still, while well, I was talking, there's a point in there where I talk about uh, how I always, I still do it to this day, try to find theme music for a moment, a song I like. It doesn't even have to be something that's popular at the time, but something that will trigger a memory in years to come and bring that back to you. And I did that with the song uh, If by David Gates and Bread. Anybody remember that bubbly little carbonated song? <laughs> uh, 
I was falling madly in love with this actor. Are we going to hear a little phrase of it? No. No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'm going to quote the line okay, to yeah. you. Mm-hmm. And, I, and she made me take out, uh, you, you can't use lyrics in memoirs because it's too expensive to buy the rights. So you have to kind of retell it. And so, but the, uh, that was, the song moved me so much. It's about, you know, if a man can be two places at one time, I'd be with you tomorrow and today, beside you all the way, and something, something. Uh, and when my love for life is running dry, you come and pour yourself on me. And I said, I thought that was kind of appropriate, since I recall that happened at least twice. (laughs) This is what prompted your editor. And, to and the- my editor has impeccable taste. And <laughs> that's a little tacky. Just don't do that. Don't. <laughs> Save it for an audience, you know. So you got it. You're, yeah, there it is. <laughs> Bears or not, you got it. Yeah. Um. We have a question up here in the center. Hi. Um, I really appreciated hearing about your transformation coming from being in more conservative environments and then you named yourself as a radical now and the idea of logical family and really expanding our notions of who are we standing with who are we standing by and you were talking about um is it still an issue right now like is there still oppression is there still challenges to be gay or queer and you spoke about other countries and i felt sad about Um, there's such a genocide of especially women, trans women of color, and I was curious about your perspectives of the larger LGBT community and how we face oppression in this current country right now. Um, Well, you you just named it right there. They're being murdered in the streets of America, trans women of color. And um, uh, It's all connected. All of this is connected. The Harvey Weinstein thing and what women have gone through just in general for years, it's all connected to things that have not been addressed and that we know exist. Um, I don't know what to tell you exactly, except that I feel all of that. when When I came out, every letter in LGBT, although we didn't have that alphabet soup at the time, was important to me. That's why I put Anna Madrigal at 28 Barbary Lane. Um, It all seemed to me to be the same thing, the right to love and be yourself and express yourself the way you want. That's the essence of freedom, and it should be the essence of America. And it's pathetic that there's other places now that have just gone way past us uh, in that regard. Sorry, I don't have a, a big speech to make about that, except that I'm, I stay upset about it. <laughs> but you run out of things, right? After a while, you have to sort of l- let yourself feel some joy. And it's easy to do in this town, that's for sure. There's always a, some wonderful little scene playing out around you of kindness, mm. compassion. We have time for one last question. Oh, wait, no, no, two. (laughs) Okay, two more questions. I had this explained to me at the Smithsonian. (laughs) And they can't. If you make it one last question and it's a dud, everybody goes home miserable. (laughs) (laughs) So there's no pressure on that at all. No, this is going to be a good one. Um, So this next question is right here. Do I stand? Army, this is Bart from the Duck House days. Hi, Bart. Remember? I do. I remember you banging away on that selectric trying to get those. Oh, you scared me for a minute there. Yeah. And the messenger coming at the last minute to grab all your papers. 
What? The messenger from the paper oh, yeah, coming yeah. to get your papers the last yeah, day. Yeah, yeah. It was we couldn't we didn't we didn't have no. any other mean other means other than uh, or a messenger. I would jump into the VW and frantically drive across town because I was, as you know, a terrible procrastinator and sometimes they had to have it right away. In the documentary, there's a fun thing from a woman that I worked with there talking about what a mess I was in that regard. <laughs> I'd love to sit there with the women in the people department and tell them about what had happened to me the night before, or <laughs> sometimes at lunch. Uh, <laughs> there was a little club about two blocks from, uh, from the Chronicle and that I would go down to and engage in, there was a cut rate price in the afternoon. It's called the Businessman Special. <laughs> I'm really trying to make this a suck it appropriate. Wait a minute, soup coat. <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> But I came, I came back to the, to the Chronicle uh, and was called into the editor's office, the big guy, uh, for some kind of a little conference. It didn't happen very often. I was sitting there talking to him and I looked down and there was a giant blob of pink bubble gum on the knee of my jeans. <laughs> so I had to, <laughs> yes sir, yeah. <laughs> Why did I tell you that? I just made it worse. <laughs> well, this is... This but is, you brought it out of me, Bart. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> that may end up being the best uh, last uh, question, um, but maybe... We, we have time for one more right here in the front. I just wanted to remind you all that Armistead's going to be signing books in the atrium after this, so please go out, buy a book, and get your book signed. And here's the last question. Um, first of all, growing up in San Francisco and your series, my daughter is so mad because you ruined her coming out. She wanted to be dramatic and really brave, and we were like, awesome, no problem. But, <laughs> <laughs> she's so mad. But I have a question. The Chronicle, it was written, um, the things that you wrote, were they thinly veiled uh, characters from San Francisco? Were they pulled right out of politics in San Francisco? How close were they to some of the people that were there um, at that time? The society columnist, Prue Giroux, uh, was inspired by Pat Montandon, right? Little murmur, of, we're Facebook friends these days, Pat and I. She's 88. She's always been an amazing self-invented creation and really a lovely person. And I got too close to some of her earnest efforts. Um, she had a round table discussion and these society ladies would, would come and those of you who've seen the first series know that she rings this little bell and she says, today we're going to rap about rape. <laughs> and it was like so well intended because it was addressing the issue that was finally getting talked about. But uh, she was very upset with me, and um, nowadays, if you buy one of Pat's m four memoirs, you will see on the jacket of the book that it says Pat Montandon as immortalized by Armistead Maupin in Tales of the City. <laughs> it's amazing how we've, we, we've just come full circle, and... Uh, and kind of lovely. I, got, I actually got her on Facebook, and suddenly there were all these adoring people that remembered her from when she ran the uh, Pat's Afternoon Movie on KRON or something. She was. <laughs> Remember that? Yep. A beautiful woman, still a beautiful woman. Um, so, and I changed it to Prue Giroux, and the in the. Pat Montandon became Pam Fontainebleau in the newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> Which was a little too close for comfort, I guess. There were others. Uh, the uh, Father Patty Starr, the, the very flouncy Catholic priest with the TV show, was inspired by a real-life very flouncy priest with a TV show. <laughs> <laughs> And I think all of the people in your, all of the 
young straight women in your life felt that they were somehow the model um, or for, for Marianne. For Marianne. I, a lot, I, there were some, I mentioned a few in the book because they really were, um, in those days I didn't know how to make friends with gay men, you know, in the light of day. Uh, <laughs> and so my friends were women and we'd talk about men together. And uh, so they were important to me. Very important. So while, while there may not be a, a perfect key to the Romana clay um, that uh, some of your early books um, may be, what's wonderful about this book is that um, it's so honest in both um, your being willing to name the people who influenced you in your life, um, for better or for worse, and in, in speaking to the truth of how you came to be who you are. And I thank you for that, and thank you for your time with us tonight. Thank you, Peter. I had a great time. That was fun. Totally fun.